Hello there, welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, the channel where we cover the entire history of the Asia-Pacific War, 1937 to 1945, and all the major events that led up to it. And now if you're not already done so, please hit that like and subscribe button as it would mean a lot to this small channel, and it feeds these two small demon birds who scream the entire time I film these episodes. This episode is one of a four-part series on World War I in Asia, and as we mentioned before, with the Battle of Tsingtsao commencing, Next is going to be the German East Asia Squadron fleeing from Tsingtao and going to the open seas of the Pacific. This episode will be on their journey as the great raiders of the Pacific during World War I. As mentioned in the previous episode, when war was declared on Germany in 1914, the German East Asia Squadron withdrew from its base in Tsingtao and attempted to make its way east across the Pacific back to Germany. The East Asia Squadron numbered five major warships in the beginning under the command of Vice Admiral Maximilian Reichsgraf von Spee. They were the Skarnhorst class cruisers SMS Skarnhorst and SMS Gizenau, the Dresden class cruiser SMS Emden, the Bremen class cruiser SMS Leipzig, and the Konigsberg class cruiser SMS Nuremberg. At the outbreak of World War I, von Spee found himself outnumbered and outgunned by enemy navies in the region. Also, nearly all the ships of the East Asia Squadron were dispersed at various island colonies on routine missions. Thus, the first action was to rendezvous at Pagan Island in the Northern Marianas. At Pagan Island, the commanders planned the logistics of their long journey to Germany. Von Spee decided to take the fleet to South America, where it could make an attempt to break through to the Atlantic and then to Germany, while harassing Allied merchant traffic along the way. Lieutenant Commander Karl von Müller suggested that one cruiser be detached for independent operations in the Indian Ocean, and von Spee agreed to allow von Müller to take SMS Emden, the fastest cruiser, for the task. Von Müller began his raids moving through the Colombo-Calcutta route, catching the Greek Corrier SS Pontoporos, the Indus, Lovat, and Kambinga, and sinking two other ships. In late September of 1914, von Müller decided to bombard Madras, believing such an attack would demonstrate his freedom of maneuver and decrease British prestige with the local population. At around 8 p.m. on September the 22nd, SMS Emden entered the port of Madras and within 3,000 yards began to open fire. She set fire to two oil tanks, damaged three others, and damaged a merchant ship in the harbor. She fired over 130 rounds and forced Britain to stop shipping in the Bay of Bengal as a result. Then Emden sank the British merchantmen Tai Wurst, King Lund, Riberia, Foil, and captured the Corrier Buresque on September the 25th while en route to Ceylon. Von Müller then planned a surprise attack on Penang of British Malaya. The Emden was outfitted to look like the British cruiser HMS Yarmouth and entered the harbor of Georgetown Von Müller found the Russian protected cruiser Zemchek, a veteran of the Battle of Tsushima, in port and pulled up 300 yards alongside it, launching a torpedo before opening fire with its 10.5 cm guns. Emden shot a second torpedo causing a tremendous explosion, tearing the ship apart and killing 81 sailors and wounding 129 men. The French cruiser Diberville and destroyer Thronde frantically fired at Emden, but she escaped unscathed. Upon leaving the harbor, the Emden ran into the French destroyer Musquet, which was unprepared for combat and was quickly destroyed. The attack on Penang gave the Entente powers a significant shock, causing them to delay large convoys from Australia, as they believed they would require more powerful escorts now. Next, von Müller decided to attack the British coaling station in the Cocos Islands, where he intended to destroy the wireless station. The Emden reached the islands during the night of November the 8th, 1914, and set ashore a party led by Helmut von Mucke at 6 a.m. to disable the wireless cable transmission station on Direction Island. The station was able to transmit a distress call before it was shut down, and Melbourne received the message, promptly sending light cruiser HMS Sydney to investigate. Meanwhile, the Germans destroyed the transmitting equipment and severed the undersea cables, at 9 a.m., the Emden saw smoke from the approaching Sydney and quickly sent signals to the shore party to hurry up, but were forced to cast off without them. At 9.40, the Emden fired first, raining shells for 10 minutes at a distance of 10,000 yards. 15 shells hit the Sydney, but only 5 exploded, sending shrapnel into the gun crews, exploding the mess deck, and killing 4 sailors, wounding 16. 
Sydney closed in and opened fire at a closer range, hitting Emden's steering gear, rangefinders, and voice pipes to the turrets and engineering. By 10.20 a.m., the two ships were dueling at 5.5 thousand yards, and Sydney fired torpedoes, which missed. Both ships continued to fire upon another, but Emden's guns were all destroyed, except for one. The Emden was drawing close to North Keeling Island, and Von Bülow ordered the ship to beach there, hoping to save his crew. The Emden ran aground at 11.20 a.m., prompting the Sydney to cease firing. At 4 p.m., the Sydney reached the Emden, signaling, Do you surrender? But the Emden only responded, What signal? No signal books. The Sydney took this as a ploy and fired two salvos into the Emden, killing 20 crewmen. The Emden then promptly raised the white flag. The Germans suffered 130 killed, with 69 wounded by the end of the battle. Von Bula and many of his officers were imprisoned in Malta at the Verdala Barracks. The rest of the crew were taken to Australia and placed in POW camps at Halsworthy, Trial Bay, and Barramie. The SMS Emden destroyed two Entente warships and sank or captured 16 British steamers, one Russian merchant ship, totaling 70,825 gross register tons. It also captured and released four more British ships and took one British and Greek ship as colliers. Meanwhile, after the rendezvous at Pagan Island, von Spee dispatched the Nuremberg with the auxiliary cruiser Titiana to Honolulu to gather news, since many German undersea cables had been cut. They were then given orders to attack Fanning Island Cable Relay Station, and on September the 7th, 1914, the Nuremberg approached Fanning Island flying a French flag, prompting the island staff to hoist the British flag. The British realized it was a German ship just as the crew were coming onto the island, and the operators sent a message to Sova warning, it's the Nuremberg, they are firing. The Germans severely damaged the cable station, amounting to over $150,000 in damage. Von Schwie's first target was to be Papit in Tahiti. Von Schwie hoped to seize their coal and destroy any Allied shipping he could find in their harbor. Along the way, Nuremberg and Titiana returned to his squadron, and Von Schwie made a reconnaissance at Bora Bora to learn what forces defended Papit. It turned out Papit was defended by 25 colonial infantry, 20 gender arms, and 160 sailors under Lieutenant Maxim Drestemau who had some land batteries, armored cars, and an old wooden gunboat named Zelle. The German cruisers heavily outgunned them, and with 1,500 sailors, outmanned them also. At 7 a.m. on September the 22nd, 1914, two identified cruisers approached the harbor of Papite, raising the French alarms. The two cruisers raised the German colors, signaling for the town to surrender, but they refused. Von Spee began to shell the shore batteries and town from 6,600 yards as the French land batteries and Zele fired back scoring no hits. The German cruisers soon turned their attention to the shipping in the harbor where they saw Zele and an old captured German ship named Valko. Von Spee fired upon both vessels, destroying them as Pepite's inhabitants fled the town being shelled, starting fires. The French destroyed their coal deposits as soon as combat commenced and the sight of the smoke was evident. Thus, von Spee withdrew his ships at 11 a.m., having done enough damage. Because von Spee was denied the coal at Papit, he sent his forces to Easter Island to coal up. The Battle of Papit now meant von Spee had lost the element of surprise in the Pacific, and his squadron was being hunted. Von Spee decided to take the squadron around the Cape Horn to break through to the Atlantic and then to Germany. Off the coast of Chile, the squadron met up with the light cruiser Dresden, which had been raiding in the area. On October the 4th, 1914, the British learnt from an intercepted radio message that von Spee planned to attack the shipping on trade routes along the west coast of South America. Rear Admiral Sir Christopher Craddock began to patrol the area with a squadron consisting of the armored cruisers HMS Good Hope, Monmouth, light cruiser Glasgow, armed merchantmen Otranto, and pre-dreadnought battleship Canopus. The squadron was obsolete and lightly armored Crewed by inexperienced naval reservists, von Spee's force were led by officers handpicked by the Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz. The German cruisers had an overwhelming advantage in range and firepower with 8.2-inch guns on the Scarnhorst and Gisenau versus 6-inch guns on the Monmouth and Good Hope, and only two 9.2-inch guns in single turrets on the Good Hope. A major problem for the British was the slow-moving canopus which hindered their operations. Thus Craddock left Canopus behind to escort some colliers as he left around the Cape Horn hunting the Germans. 
Von Spee was hunting HMS Glasgow en route to Coronel Harbour when Craddock was given word of their location. At 9.15 a.m. on November 1st, 1914, the Glasgow left Coronel Harbour to link up with Craddock in the west. The Germans approached the area at full speed, around 20 knots, and at 4.20 p.m. reached the Glasgow and the slower-moving Otranto. The two British ships began to flee south. Craddock was faced with a hard choice. He could now take his three cruisers capable of 20 knots and flee, abandoning the Otranto, to the Germans or to stay in fight with the Otranto. Craddock decided to fight, and at 5.10 p.m. he moved southeast, drawing closer to the Germans to engage. Von Spee turned his ships away, maintaining a distance, sailing parallel at 14,000 yards. And at 6.50 p.m., as the sun was setting, Von Spee began firing at 12,000 yards. German shells managed to hit the 9.2-inch guns on Good Hope within the first five minutes, leaving Good Hope with only her 6-inch guns, and Otranto's 4.7-inch guns with insufficient range to match the Germans' 8-inch guns. Craddock attempted to close the distance, requiring 6,000 yards to hit the Germans. However, by this point, the Germans' fire had become much more accurate, and Good Hope and Monmouth were being battered, catching fire, presenting themselves as targets as it got dark. Good Hope was hit at 7.50 p.m., exploding her forward section as she broke apart and sank. The Skarnhorst began to target Monmouth as Gesenau, Leipzig, and Dresden attacked Glasgow. The German light cruiser's 4-inch guns left the Glasgow unscathed, with only Gesenau's 8-inch guns doing some light damage. Because of the darkness, Glasgow was able to turn south and escape. The slower-moving Nuremberg arrived late to the battle, but sighted the badly damaged Monmouth with her searchlights. She sent the surrender signal, but Monmouth declined, and thus she fired upon the ship, sinking her. Von Spee had word that the British had a battleship in the area, and decided to flee north. 1,660 British crew had died, including Admiral Craddock. Glasgow and Otranto had both managed to escape, suffering many hits and wounded men. The Germans suffered only three wounded on the Gizenau, which had been hit by four shells. The Battle of Coronel was the first naval defeat for the British since the Battle of Lake Champlain in the War of 1812. The Germans had used half of their ammunition at the battle, which could not be replenished. In response to the loss at the Battle of Coronel, the British formed a new squadron to hunt down the German raiders. The British force, led by Admiral Sir Deviton Sturdy, consisted of the battle cruisers HMS Invincible and Inflexible, armored cruisers Carnivon, Cornwall and Kent, and light cruisers Bristol and Glasgow. The British battlecruisers could make 25.5 knots versus von Spee's 22.5 knots, and they held eight 12-inch guns, significantly outgunning von Spee. The British force arrived at Stanley Harbour on December 7, 1914, proceeding to coal up. Von Spee's vanguard of Gesenau and Nuremberg approached Stanley first, not realizing the force that awaited them. To the shock of the Germans, they were fired upon by HMS Canopus, which had been grounded as a guardian ship at Stanley behind a hill to act as a makeshift defense battery. The Germans simultaneously saw the distinctive tripod masts of the British battlecruisers in the port and von Spee gave orders to flee to open sea. Sturdy's force took off in pursuit by 10 a.m. At 1 p.m., the British battlecruisers, sailing at 25 knots, caught up to the Germans first and opened up fire at 16,000 yards. The Gesenau was hit three times in the aft starboard's middle deck and ammunition hold. The Germans fired back, managing to hit the Invincible, but only doing minor damage. By 2 p.m., the Germans turned south in search of bad weather to aid their escape. The duels continued as Sturdy detached his three cruisers to chase Leipzig and Nuremberg. Then the two battlecruisers managed to present their broadsides to Skarnhorst and Gesenau at 3 p.m., Von Spee could do nothing but try to draw in closer in order to fire back, which only exposed his ships even more. At 3.30 p.m., the ships began to exchange fire. Skarnhorst took extensive damage and sank in a fiery storm by 4.17 p.m., taking Von Spee, two of his sons, and her entire crew of 795 men with her. The Geza now fired back and evaded fire until 5.17 p.m. when she ran out of ammunition. The British crossed her T, firing upon her, and she began to list and slowly sank by 6.02 p.m., sending 190 survivors into the water. Both British battlecruisers had received 40 hits between them, with only one crew member dying and four injured. Meanwhile, the SMS Nuremberg and Leipzig were fleeing when at 5.30 p.m. Nuremberg had exhausted her engines 
and turned to battle the Kent. Nuremberg closed in, 3,000 yards firing all of her guns. The more heavily armored Kent shot Nuremberg over 40 times, taking out her boilers, steering, and sending her aflame from bow to stern. Nuremberg expended all of her ammunition, hitting Kent 38 times before capsizing and sinking by 7.27 p.m. The duel was a slaughter fest. Only 11 men were picked up out of the water from Nuremberg, while Kent only suffered 8 deaths. Leipzig was chased by Cornwall and Glasgow. Soon Leipzig also exhausted her engines and turned to engage the enemy. Leipzig fired at Glasgow at 3 p.m., bearing her 6-inch guns and then her 4-inch guns when distance was closed. By continuously turning her broadside to duel Glasgow, Cornwall gradually caught up by 4.17 p.m. Cornwall opened fire with her nine 6-inch guns at 10,500 yards, battering Leipzig. The duel had turned into an execution as Leipzig lost its steering, ammunition, and was on fire. By 7 p.m., all she had left was torpedoes, and she fired all of them, all of them missing. The crew began to run to the decks to jump ship as British shells sent shrapnel across the decks, causing carnage. Two distress flares were shot up, and the British ships seized fire as Leipzig capsized and sank, leaving only 18 survivors scrambling in the water. The British had around 10 deaths and 19 wounded. The battle was over, and SMS Dresden was the only ship to escape. 215 Germans survived and were taken prisoner. The German East Asia Squadron effectively ceased to exist. The Dresden and some auxiliary ships tried to retreat to the Pacific to continue raiding, but HMS Glasgow caught up to them at the island of Massetere, and Dresden was no match. She was destroyed with 315 of her remaining crew interned at Chile until the end of the war. Now let's just summarize everything we've now learnt. At the offset of World War I, the German East Asia Squadron set out to raid everywhere they could before trying to get back safely to Germany. The Emden was on a solo mission in the Indian Ocean causing absolute mayhem until she was brought down by the Sydney. Von Spee and the rest of the squadron made a real name for themselves, attacking Pacific Islands and defeating Craddock at the Battle of Coronel. Ultimately, Von Spee's squadron met their doom at the hands of Sturdy Squadron, ending the German presence in Asia and the Pacific. We hope you enjoyed this episode on German Raiders of the Pacific during World War I. If you've not already done so, please hit that like and subscribe button. It would mean a lot to this small channel. And as you can see, my little demon birds are running amok as I'm trying to film this. So join us next time for China's forgotten involvement during World War I. This has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out.